My name is Bonnie Jean Feldkamp. I'm a, I'm a fellow writer and Irma Bombeck fan. I've never sat in one of Dr. Gina Barreca's formal classrooms, but I've learned a lot from her. She's the cheerleader I never knew I had. I don't know if it's ingrained in her as an educator, but she really does want you to succeed. It shows in her columns, shows in her best-selling books, in her presentations, and in her one-on-one -on -one conversations. As a feminist scholar, she understands that though women face many challenges, sometimes our biggest challenge is getting past the voice inside our head, that noise and negativity. Gina was a keynote speaker, my first Irma Bombeck conference, and she was my favorite. She, she blew it out of the water. The next conference I came to, she serendipitously sat at my dinner table. And from there, I connected with her on social media. I welcomed her advice. And because of Gina's guidance, one of my essays was picked up by the New York Times. Yes. What I love about learning from Gina is that she's kind, but she's not condescending. She's honest, but she's not harsh. She's the kind of person that will reach her hand back for you as she keeps moving forward. She does it with good humor, if not gut-busting laughter. <laughs> Listen well to what she's about to say. Her guidance will propel you forward no matter what your goals are. And for you Twitter users out there, hashtag loud smart women, that's Regina. And also hashtag 2016 EBWW. Thank you, Gina, very much. If you've heard me speak before, you know I don't write things down because I like to get the sense of what's going right with the audience and to have a real sort of connection, which is hard to do if you're looking down all the time. Not only down someone's blouse, just looking down. It's better when you're making eye contact. It's better when the conversation is, is actually going on. Women who were writing what Bombeck wrote better than anybody was this really insurgent, seditious, troublemaking humor disguised as conventional domestic humor. We smuggle in dangerous ideas under our little funny lines. We go, oh no, it's just, we're just talking about the children. Are they gone? <laughs> One of the things that's true about love, you know, they always say that love is blind. That's actually not true. Love is, however, deaf. <laughs> so, when Irma Bombeck, we've got her as this great humor writer, writing about her children, writing about her family, writing about her marriage. But we also have her, for example, as a very active, active activist. Not just a sidelines activist, but a real activist for the Equal Rights Amendment. This is a woman who is a feminist. This is somebody who used the F word, right? Because the F word in our culture is feminist. Everybody uses the other F word, without thinking about it, right? But feminist, it's still a little dangerous. You have women coming up going, well, I'm not really a feminist. What does that mean? They think that means that if you're a feminist, you have to be you know, wearing a fedora and smoking a cigar. Feminism, of course, as everybody here would agree, feminism is simply the right to be treated as a human being, right? You think women are human beings? Woohoo! you're a feminist. If you think that women should have the vote, you're on the radical fringe. We know that the world has prepared for women a lot of um, assumptions, implications, hidden scripts that we have to wrestle with and we think it's us individually until we find out that it's everybody else culturally. Because every woman in the audience wants to know the woman behind the mic, we're looking at each other trying to guess each other's weight and age like we're at a state fair. You have never heard a man say, I want to be a 42 short by the holidays. <laughs> and that's because men buy clothes that fit them. What an amazing idea. We try to fit our bodies into clothes, off the rack. We think if we don't fit into something, there's something wrong with us. Going back to Irma, what Irma Bombeck did for all of us was to let us know that we didn't have to be perfect. She wasn't a size two. She wasn't, you know, she was a beautiful woman, but glamour was not her game. 
right? Now even talk show hosts have to look as if they would be Vogue models. We're all supposed to play up on that glamorous idea. Irma Bombeck made sure that we were not um, trapped in those conventional exercises. She was able to connect, that he would, you know, people would say, doesn't your husband come to hear you give a talk? And she said, I don't go work with him, he doesn't come to work with me. I mean, to come up with those answers, because otherwise we all feel guilty about it, right? So that if people would call him Mr. Irma Bombeck, like that was an insult, right? Because for 3,000 years, the correct way is to say, you know, this is Mrs. Bill Bombeck, with an eraser of the first name, and that erasure of the first name is so that another woman's name can be substituted. But it is. I mean, culturally, historically, that's how it worked. Because the woman is replaceable. The man is irreplaceable. We're the accessory. Women writers sort of get erased very quickly. If we're not the ones who are thinking back through our foremothers, if we're not the ones who are remembering the women who came before us and recognizing them, Right? And if we all say, who are your favorite humorists? And we all say, Robert Benchley, Dave Barry, if the only names that come out of your mouth are men's names, right? You're not honoring the tribe that you're with. But Replier is writing about humor, and she never married, lived into her 90s, apparently smoked like four packs of cigarettes a day, um, supported her family through her writing, supported a disabled brother who lived to a very old age, who lived with her, traveled alone, did all these things alone when women were not supposed to go out on chaperone or on a company. I'll spell her name. Replier, R-E-P-P-L-I-E-R. -E -E and so she was, she wrote something about not particularly liking little children. Now that's like, I don't know, shooting somebody's gerbil or something, right? I mean, you're not allowed to say you don't like little children. That's really, and especially if you're a woman, it makes you unnatural, it makes you a monster, it makes you. So she wrote something that was not flattering about little children and was taken apart by the critics. They all looked like this. <laughs> taken apart by the critics because she was taking on the sacred space of motherhood. They wouldn't have said it then, but the sacred topic of motherhood and not treating it with, you know, the, the sense of gravitas that it needed to be dealt with and how dare she do this as somebody who wasn't a mother herself. And Replier had the greatest answer when people are saying you can't make fun of that, right? That's too dangerous. You can't make fun of that. She said only false gods are laughed off their pedestals. If something is truly important, if something matters, if something is sacred, if something is significant, no humor is gonna be able to dislodge that. Humor can only bring the truth into a better light so we can all see it. The best humor allows us to know that we're not alone, right? How many times do you read something that makes you laugh, but you suddenly feel like, oh God, I thought I was the only one who went through this? I was giving a talk at a town hall in Texas, and I was telling this story, and there were a lot of elegant women really wearing like St. John suits for real. And uh, the one woman, after doing the question and answer, put up her hand, and she was very elegant and very lovely. And she said, now, Professor Baraka, I can't do a southern accent, but Professor Baraka, imagine your best Texas, but classy Texas, dynasty accent. <laughs> and um, Professor Baraka, um, you, you said that women don't do the head banging, eye poking humor that, that uh, the, the Three Stooges, but you did not explain why we don't like the, and you know she had never said this word out loud in public before. <laughs> did not explain why we don't like the fart scene in Blazing Sounds. And before I could answer, woman from the back yelled out, we don't like it because we live with it. <laughs> Women's humor is different. Women's humor is about telling a story, about making connections. And usually it starts with something absolutely true that happened to us. And you know the old adage that says, pain plus time equals humor. We go back to making humor usually out of the worst things that have happened to us, right? Because humor, in essence, is redemptive. Humor allows us to go back and to make stories ours, okay? Humor permits us to redeem. It's like getting your deposit back on pain. It really is. It's like going to the pawn shop and that you realize that you've been carrying this ticket in your pocket the whole time and something crucial is there, there's some memory, there's some incident, there's something that happened to you, something that was done to you, something that made you unhappy, 
something that made you uncomfortable. And if you get to tell the story about it, and if you can go far enough to make that story funny, you get the full purchase of that story back. And that is, not, that is no longer something that happened to you. That is your story. That is something that you control. That is something that makes a difference. Let me read you a little bit from um, If You Lean In, Will Men Just Look Down Your Blouse? And this one is um, about really uh, learning to tell stories. Because maybe, like um, some of you, I was not encouraged um, as a little girl to be loud, troublemaking. I was raised as a good girl. I just abandoned, <laughs> you know, the proposition. And um, the idea that, that girls were always supposed to be good, be more mature, don't make trouble, let it go, don't sink to that level, you're better than that, oh, come on, why, why you know, call that stuff up again, why do this? This is not how life goes. To sit at the grown-up table, you have to accept responsibility for everything that you do. And this is, the, um, this is one of the parts that, I'm, first, again, this book came out four days ago, so I'm still learning the book. So here we go, and it's really such an honor to be able to read a little bit. So these are always the, the first bits that I'm reading. This is one is called, um, and this is uh, from a section called, If You Knew My Family, You'd Understand, and it's called Why I Tell Stories. It's all true. You make a story out of everything, they told me when I was a kid, and it wasn't a compliment. It meant I had a big mouth. It meant I wasn't good at secrets. But making up a story was the only way I knew how to translate pain into toughness, to turn a lie into an accomplishment, and to make something sad have a certain ending. If you could make it into a story, you could make it into something that could stop. If you could make it into a story, you could make it yours. Right next to the computer in my home office, I have a badge that the Girl Scouts gave to me. I got a badge, it's in the book, but I'll just tell you, I got a badge for storytelling. And I thought, that was amazing. I mean, it's really, there are some things you treasure. My badge, it's a, it's a big um, embroidered, I'm gonna put the t-shirt right there, but it's a big badge embroidered and has a book on it and a magic wand, and it starts with once upon a time. So when I feel useless, terrible, like I will never write anything of value again, it's like every seven hours, and I look at the badge. And um, I was never a Girl Scout, right? I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, you can tell, right? I've taught in Connecticut for 28 years. No one has ever come up and said, Professor Barreca, what part of Connecticut do you come from? <laughs> it's never a question. I sound like I'm from Ocean Avenue, I'm from Ocean Avenue. And so when I was growing up, the phrase, what do you want, a badge? You know, it was uh, not put there to inspire you. So this was a new thing. So it wasn't until, you know, I got up there to accept the badge at this lovely ceremony, and I wanted to say that if I had been a Girl Scout, I would have known that trees had different names, <laughs> you know, that birds had different names, that, you know, this is, and I said if I had been a Girl Scout, you know, I would have known how to set a fire. And, the head of the Girl Scout Council actually came up on the podium and she said, we don't say set a fire. We say make a fire. We say start a fire. We don't say set a fire. <laughs> and that's why word choice is important. Just when you're getting to word choice, because I'm still going back to my own neighborhood. Well, it's good to know how to set a fire. You know, you get the insurance money. But this was... And, you know, so where I came from, they didn't call it storytelling, they called it lying. And so it was really nice to sort of reframe that idea and think about what I could do as something that was meaningful and significant. And the whole truth, of course, was they also called it making a big deal out of nothing, having a mouth on her, and not being able to shut her up. When I'm talking about the women who came before us and the writers who came before us, I think it's so important to understand that we're part of a tradition, right? And that that tradition is our telling our stories from our perspective and not trying to cross-dress as a male writer. The only thing there is is for somebody to understand that you're saying it the way only you can say it. That's what you've got. You know that whole thing on having 10,000 hours makes you an expert? The one thing everybody in this room is an expert on is herself or himself. I've learned just to tell the truth. I mean, for the first few years, I was, again, trying to be the good girl, no more. And so it's like, how can we save time? 
stop apologizing for everything we say and everything we do. I'm like the woman whisperer. Men come up, why do they do that? Why, why do they do, just tell me, just tell me why. Why do you people do that? What, what is it? Do you really not, can you not speak? Can you not just get a boy to girls? And I said, because we were raised to be good girls. We want to cover the territory. We want to make sure everybody knows that they're important. But one of the things that we have trouble doing is making sure that we let ourselves know that we're important. The idea of writing is that you keep writing. You keep writing all the time and you take no excuses and you don't allow yourself to take any excuses. Can we learn to say thank you? When somebody gives us a compliment, we could say thank you. It would be an amazing thing to do. We don't apologize before we speak. I don't know what you're gonna think. I don't know what you're gonna do. Maybe this is too much. Women apologize for the weather, right? Oh, it's a little cold, I'm sorry. It's like, I, I didn't know I was supposed to sacrifice the chickens to you. That's, now I know who the weather goddess is. That's fabulous. But in some way, what that does is to abdicate responsibility for the real stuff. You can't, like I said, no hide and seek. You can't make excuses for yourself. There really is. There's always bad stuff. I have a chapter in here. Is that good, bad times come no matter what, right? Bad times come no matter what. Bad times break down the windows. They crawl in under the door. They, they're like bad odors and and germs and things you can't see. Bad times will figure out how to get into your life. Nobody escapes them. But good times are like a guest. They need to be welcomed. You have to open the door to good times. They need to be invited back, okay? They are not gonna come back if you didn't seem happy when they first arrived. You have to celebrate every single thing. If you get something and you're not proud of yourself, you're not celebrating it, you're not sharing it with other people, You've just given that good time. Why should good time come back again if you haven't done that, right? So we have to welcome those good times. We are responsible, really, for making our own pleasure. We're not only responsible for creating our own humor, right, and enjoying the humor of others, but we are responsible for making sure that celebration, we can just go into the song now, where that celebration <laughs> comes into our life because the bad times will come in uninvited, but the good times will come in only when you open the door and you say, I'm so glad you're here, I've been waiting, and I can't wait to see you again. And I really believe that, I really believe that. Thank you, yes. There are certain cultural things that need not only to be criticized, but need to be dismantled. So we talk about, you know, that certain women open doors for other women. What we need to do, and it was Bella Abzug who said this, what we need to do is not just to open the door for other people, we need to dismantle the wall that that door is in.